recording. Hi everyone. I'm Olivia Ambrogio. This is the Plain Spoken Science webinar through AGU's Sharing Science program. Thank you very much all for attending, especially on such a uh, busy day. Newsline. So this webinar is part of AGU's Sharing Science program, which is the program we have that um, gives our members the resources the uh, skills, the opportunities, and the hands-on support to share their science with a variety of audiences. So we're online. I hope you'll check out our website. Uh, become a member if you haven't already joined the network. Check us out on Twitter. And I'll talk more about this in a minute. And I'm happy to take questions about the program as well. So as I said, I'm Olivia Ambrogio. I'm the manager of the Sharing Science Program here at AGU. Uh, my background is actually in biology, though. I got a PhD in biology where I very much enjoyed studying the sex lives of marine snails. Um, but because my background is also in communications, I ended up feeling that there was a niche for me in this sort of uh, in-between area of science communication and the facilitation of science communication. And that's how I ended up at AGU. And our other presenter, Jana Goldman, will introduce herself. Hi, I'm Jana Goldman. Um, I own now Press Here. It's a science communication firm, and uh, I work with scientists to help them communicate with everybody else. Uh, but my background uh, is a, I was a newspaper reporter and editor uh, for many, many years, then came to Washington where I was the director of uh, two nonprofits. I've been a deputy press secretary for a U.S. senator, and for 14 years I was the uh, public affairs officer for NOAA's research office, the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. Um, when I retired, I thought, uh, what did I really want to do? And the things that I liked best about my job were working with scientists, working with the media, and working with plain language. So I was very fortunate to be able to combine all three in press here. Um, I've been a member of AGU's uh, Sharing Science Advisory Board uh, for a while, but this is my first opportunity to actually uh, do something as a member of that board. So I was, very, I was delighted when Olivia and, Sh and Shane invited me to participate in today's webinar. Well, we're very grateful that you can participate. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, just a reminder that we're going to be, this webinar is being recorded and we will share the archived webinar with all of you um, within about a week's time. Sometimes it takes a little while for it to render, but we'll send you that link so that you can refer to it whenever you want to. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about speaking the same language as your audience. So the title of this webinar is Plain Spoken Science. So why be plain spoken? Why is that something that we're harping upon as part of uh, communications and the Sharing Science Program? Well, that's because often much as we would like them to, facts don't actually speak for themselves. Either they say nothing at all to your audience, or worse, they suggest to the, your audience that you're being deliberately elitist, whether you want to be or not. So being plain spoken is really about being accessible. This is not to say that it's about dumbing things down. So this isn't being about boring or uh, not having the opportunity for eloquence. And it's definitely not about treating your audience as if they're stupid. It's about knowing that your listener may care about different things and simply have a different level of specialized education than you do. So for example, you know, I have a PhD in biology. I am pretty well read. But when I go to the car mechanic to find out what's wrong with my car, I don't want them to tell me all of the technical information. I want to know, in general terms, what's wrong, how long it'll take to fix it, and how much it'll cost. That's not dumbing down. That's distilling the information to what I actually want to know. So when we're talking about the value of being plain spoken, if you make a comment like this uh, on the left, you're going to lose a lot of your audience before you start. So something like, due to the after effects of ice sheets levering up areas of the East Coast 20,000 years ago, portions of the East Coast are experiencing land subsidence that will exacerbate other sea level rise. If instead you say something like what's on the right, then you're really going to be cutting out opaque words and also leading with what matters to the community. So you're saying parts of the East Coast are especially vulnerable to flooding because of a combination of global sea level rise and local land sinking. 
They've cut out some details, but you've led with what will matter to this coastal community, and you're making it accessible because it has uh, words and uh, concrete examples that are relevant to your audience. So a large part of being plain spoken is reducing or eliminating jargon. Uh, because otherwise you end up into situations like the cartoon here, where it ends up being rather than a way for you to be communicating your passion and enthusiasm about the science that you want to talk about. Instead, you've created another barrier between you and your audience rather than building trust and dialogue. So what does jargon mean? Uh, you know, it includes a lot of different things. Technical terminology, obviously, but also things like undefined or excessive acronyms, something we in DC are especially fond of. Um, obscure words, unnecessarily long words, and also words with multiple meanings. So a lot of these definitions are sort of um, clearly self-evident, but what do I mean by words with multiple meanings? Well, when you talk about modeling, for example, not very many people are going to be thinking about computer simulations. They're going to be thinking about models. And in fact, we actually had someone at one of our workshops come up to us and say, oh my gosh, this happened to me. I asked this guy once if he did modeling and he thought I was coming on to him. <laughs> you know, if you're talking about a driver, people think that you're talking about someone conducting a car somewhere or about golf. They're not thinking about influential factors. If you talk about positive feedback, they think it's a good thing. So this is not to say that you can never use these words with phrases. It's just to say that you want to really think about what associations your audience is going to have with those words and how you can do something to offset those and make your meaning more clear. So this is a whole list of these words that we've created. Um, and there's a link right there. You can get to it, a nice printable version through our website and refer to. And if you think of other words that you think would fit this list, please let us know because we're always looking to add more to it. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about jargon and how to get rid of it. Uh, this is jargon, uh, sorry, Greta, the jargon monster. So if you look at some of the words that she's spewing out, uh, you'll probably recognize them uh, from your own field or from the fields of those you work with. And some of them might clearly be jargon to you and you can recognize them as such, but some of them you might not think of that way. And that's the really tricky thing about jargon. We're so steeped with it in whatever profession we're in that we often don't even notice that what we're saying is less than accessible. So how do you do that? How do you figure out what's jargon and what to get rid of? One really good thing you can do is talk with a friend who's a non-scientist um, before you're going to talk with whatever other audience you're planning to speak with. Because if they're a good friend, they can tell you in a nice way when you're making sense and when they don't know what you're talking about. But another way to really sort of raise your vocabulary to the ground and then build it back up is through a challenge that developed from the cartoon XKCD, which you may or may not be familiar with. XKCD was created by Randall Monroe, who's a physicist who used to work at NASA and now does cartooning full time, but still includes a lot of science in uh, what he draws. And one of his more famous cartoons is the Upgoer 5. This is when he described the Saturn V rocket using only the 10 hundred most common words in the English language. And he said 10 hundred because thousand is not one of those most common words. So you can see he uses, it's, it's pretty funny, the descriptions here, you know, um, people box, cold air for burning and breathing. This part had a very big problem once. Um, so he's able to use humor, but you can also see that he actually describes quite a lot, quite well. Now, this was hugely popular, not surprisingly, in the scientific community, so much so that a geneticist named Theo Sanderson created the Upgoer 5 text editor. So this is basically um, a text box where you can enter whatever you want to say, and you'll find out whether those words are among the 10 hundred uh, most commonly used ones or not, so that you can actually use Upgoer speak to describe scientific con uh, concepts. And also, um, there's a link at the bottom here 
Randall Monroe also created his own version of this text editor called the Simple Writer. So there's a link to that as well if you want to check it out. So this is what it looks like if you put uh, technical language, like this is what I used to study, into the text editor. And you can see that pretty much all of the important words that I have put in here are forbidden words. So here's the version that I wrote that I was able to use um, that was acceptable via the text editor. And you can see that there are a lot more words. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you're using more words with the words that your audience understands, then you know that's really OK. There's no point in being succinct if you haven't actually communicated anything. Some people have used this to really good effect. I mean, sometimes it's funny or silly, but sometimes it's, it's really eloquent. So this is an example uh, describing Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. All the animals and green things we see in the world have all been made by the same fixed, easy steps acting all around us. These easy steps, taken in the largest sense, are being, growing, and having babies, being like your parents, but not exactly like them, and being able to avoid dying for as long as possible. Now, I'm not saying that uh, you should use UpGoer 5 language to speak with other audiences by and large, because usually it's going to really is going to be an oversimplification, and people might hit you. But mm -hmm. it's a really great way to start things out where this is going to guarantee that you are no longer using jargon. You're no longer using a whole lot of words. But what it really means and what it forces you to do is get to the heart of what you're trying to talk about. So what is it the essence of my research and of the message that I want to get out? And once you've been able to put it in that extra simple language, you can make it more conversational really easily. Uh, at AGU, we've actually hosted a session during the full meeting, AGU's conference, uh, two years in a row now, called the UpGoer 5 Challenge. And last year, 18 brave people described their research for five minutes. They did get to use slides, but they had to use only these thousand most common words. And they did a fantastic job, and it was hilarious and informative. So you can check out our Storify of that event. The link is on the screen. And if you're going to fall meeting this year, then I encourage you to look for the session because we proposed one again this year, and I think it's going to be great. OK, so I've talked a little bit about how to be uh, a little more accessible when you're plain spoken. And now Jen is going to talk about how to actually connect with your audience. Thanks, Olivia. Um, I love that up forward channel. The, uh, of course, five challenge, and I'm going to uh, participate this year in uh, uh, New Orleans because that sounds like great fun. So Olivia's uh, spent some time on showing you some examples on how to make it clear. We're going to talk a little bit about how to make it interesting and how to make it relevant. So there is a thought that if you put Harry Potty Potter and V on top of uh, uh, something that's pretty wordy, everybody's going to read it because everybody knows who Harry Potter is. And of course, it's uh, going to be interesting and exciting because all of the Harry Potter books are. So we've got to do a little more than just putting Harry Potter and V on top of the title of your research paper. And storytelling is a good way to do it. And scientists do tell good stories. Um, there's a lot of ways where you can tell the story of your work. Um, where you work is always interesting to people. Um, work in the Arctic, in the deep ocean, uh, Cleveland. I know some people who've done amazing work in Cleveland. Um, what it's like where you work. People are always interested in what, what you eat, where you sleep, you know, where you take care of uh, per personal business. My husband's an anthropologist, and people are always asking him, where do you go to the bathroom, you know, and uh, interesting things like that. What, what what do you get to wear, special clothing? I know people who work in Antarctica um, uh, are always uh, envied by others because they get to wear those beautiful, neat red parkas. I like your origin story, too. What got you here? I'm sure when, you know, most people were five years old, they didn't want to, they, you know, wanted to be a, uh, weren't quite sure what they wanted to be, but not many of them were thinking atmospheric chemist or um, uh, you know oceanographer. Although 
a lot of people in my generation did become marine science uh, scientists because Jacques Cousteau was uh, in on everybody's TV sets at that time. This is when his TV show took us into the ocean with him and it stimulated a lot of interest in uh, new science. Um, uh, NASA got a lot of information, uh, an interest in uh, space science when we finally landed on the moon. So what got you here? What was that, that special thing that made you decide to devote your life's work? to what you're doing. In some cases, it could be an accident. You were filling in for a colleague who was doing something else that was, uh, or you were just assigned this project because you were the only one around to do it, and you suddenly became interest, uh, interested in it. But people are interested in why you do what you do. Also remember why you became a scientist, the enthusiasm, the drive, um, my husband's been an anthropologist for 40 years and he still gets excited when he talks about uh, the people with whom he worked in Papua New Guinea and that's something that I hope you know never dies with him because he still has that enthusiasm and that affection for the work that he's done. Another thing people like to do are cool tools. You know what you use to do your work. This is another way to get people interested in your story. When I was at NOAA, people were always fascinated to find out that a lot of the buoys that we used at NOAA to monitor the Pacific Ocean for uh, signs of an impending El Nino were not bought at 1-800-BUOYS-ARE-US, but were an actual collaboration between the scientists and the engineers. The scientists discussing the types of data that needed to be collected under the uh, and under the conditions that they needed to be collected, and the engineers taking their know-how and creating instruments that would be able to withstand high waves, um, not being, not having to be maintained for you know couples of years, um, be able to be moored at the bottom or anchored at the bottom of the ocean and not drift away, so they can still continue to collect data in a certain area. Um, these, this is another way where you can get people interested in what you're doing. And again, people are very visual. Um, they like sights. They like sounds. They also like other living things. And I saw this image actually the day before I, the day I had to turn in my presentation and Olivia was very kind and let me add this. But I thought this image of whales uh, by Paul Nicolan and he was uh, interviewed on Terry Gross and just that image blows everybody away that you can just imagine wow what is it like to work there work with these animals see these animals feel that ocean feel the the wind um, these are things that only you can describe if you are actually the scientist doing that work so there are um, scientists who tell good stories like Neil deGrasse Tyson who's in the top left of your uh, screen and there are good storytellers who really love science like Alan Alda who's at the bottom right. Um, Alan Alda has a new book out and um, the title of it is uh, If I Understood What You Said Would I Have This Look On My Face. I just got it from Amazon so I didn't read it all but he has been an amazing advocate for science for a long, long time, and there is the Allen Alda School of, of Science Communication at uh, Stony Brook in New York. He teaches scientists using improvisational uh, methods to communicate, and he doesn't want them to be improvisational comedians. He wants them to learn empathy. He wants them to learn different ways of communicating. He wants them to actually look they're, uh, the person with whom they're communicating in the eye and make that kind of connection. So some story basics. Um, stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and one of my uh, uh, friends, Cheryl Stevens, who's, who's uh, one of the uh, queens of, of the plain language movement, reminded me that stories actually add, they are the framework for the facts. So this is something that you can device where you can hang the facts on. And even though stories have a beginning and, and a middle and an end, you need to have some tension somewhere going up toward that middle or else uh, people will say, well, yeah, so, you know, it rained, I went inside, 
and went, took a nap. I mean, that's got a, kind of a beginning, a middle, and end. Randy Olson, who was a, a marine scientist, and he also is an author of, you know, uh, Stop Sounding So Much Like a Scientist. I think I've uh, gotten that correct. Um, he talks about storytelling a lot, and he has a, a way where uh, you can add some tension to your stories. And he calls it the and, but therefore. And his idea is that most scientists will present their work, uh, we did this, and, and then we did this, and, then we did this, and, then we did this. And he says a, a simple way to take your stuff is to take, uh, say, well, we did this, and we did this, but this happened, therefore, and already you can see where there's a, a little device where you can add some tension to your work and make your story a little bit better. Try out your stories, too. Try them out on um, your family. Try them out on your neighbors. Try them out on the people who you think are going to be your audiences. So here's what it would actually look like. So you've got the scientists there on the, on the left, and it's the and, and, and. And on the right, you've got the and, but, therefore, which would make it a little more interesting. So how do you do it? Um, tell people, uh, let people know why they should care about your work. What you know, it's uh, what we call the news business. The you know, the says who, you know, the so what. You know, why should people care? I know you've got a lot of interesting things to say about your work, but try to find out three or four main points. And I think Olivia mentioned this earlier. Distill them down into three, into those three, po three or four points, and make until they're easy to understand. And of course, watch out for that jargon and acronyms or abbreviations. You can also prepare some memorable quotes um, using declarative statements. So if we keep putting heat trapping gases in the atmosphere, it'll trap heat. That's something that people can easily understand. But then here's another way. Because you get people to say, well, why should I really care? And, and I've used this, uh, the, this set of slides in, in another talk. Um, but um, we're talking about extinctions. And so, okay, so this is an extinct algae. Yeah, I, I think I can get a, you know, I can live without this algae. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it does. Yeah, so, gee, that, that flower is pretty and it's too bad it's extinct. But, you know, it really doesn't make any difference in my life. That, that uh, rhinoceros beetle, well, you know, there's so many hundreds of thousands of beetles. We can live without, you know, a couple of species. So, so it's okay if they're not around anymore. That bird, yeah, you know, it's pretty, but uh, I don't know. I, it's a bird. I'm not big on birds. I can, I can live without this bird. The thylacine uh, or, the, or the Tasmanian tiger, well, you know, I've never seen one, so I really don't care if it's extinct or not. So that really doesn't matter to me. And you know what, those other people, too many people on the planet anyway, I can do without those other people. So how do you get people to care about what, what your work is? How do you make it um, relevant to them when they see that it could possibly happen in their own backyard? This is a, the uh, fires that happened in Alberta, Canada last uh, around this time last year, and they were terrible fires. They were absolutely devastating. They were so fast, so fierce. So fierce. And uh, people had to get out of town quickly. All of a sudden, you're seeing images like this: cars of uh, lines of cars of people trying to ev evacuate through uh, dense smoke. And all of a sudden, you start thinking, you know what? I could be in those cars. My family could be in those cars. That could happen to me. Um, you might not have to be as dramatic as that, but that's basically the point: getting people to care about your story. Thanks so much. So what's next? Um, well, for one thing, I hope that all of you, if you are not already sharing your science, will consider doing so. And again, please refer to our website and our other resources to help you with this. We would love to help you personally. You can contact us. Um, again, join the Sharing Science Network if you haven't already, whether you're already communicating or just want to start communicating to wider audiences. If you do, you get a nifty newsletter every month that tells you all about ways to engage and new skills building opportunities, also examples of inspiring science communication, and a whole lot in the area of the science of science communication because there's a whole field looking at 
how effective different kinds of science communication are and what perceptions are of different communication styles uh, and skills. And for some additional resources, and again, this will be archived for your reference, but a little bit more that we have on jargon and how to avoid it, some tips and tools for clear communication. You should check out our blog, The Plain Spoken Scientist, in which we have a lot of uh, guest bloggers talking about their experiences doing science communication and what got them into it and um, how it worked. Obviously, you can follow John on, on Twitter because we're great. Thank you. Um, and with that, we'll start answering some questions. So if you haven't already and you have a question, please use the question box and type in your question, and we can address as many of them as we have time for. So thank you very much again for tuning in. And Shane Hanlon, uh, a senior specialist in sharing science, will be our moderator in this session. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, so yeah, so if you all want to um, ask questions, you can just type them in, and then um, I'll be curating. So um, one we have here, um, sometimes stories of what went wrong resonate well with people. Thinking of um, overly honest methods, the hashtag that went around Twitter a while back, um, because it makes you and science uh, relatable and human. Yet such admissions can uh, compromise the trust people have in the scientific process and scientific results. So any suggestions on ways to kind of toe that line between making it human versus, um, I guess, reputable? Um, I can take that. Um, that's a great question. And um, when I was at NOAA, we had, uh, in the research office, one of our engineers uh, was talking to the assistant administrator, and he says, um, one, one of the many reasons I really like my job is because it's okay to fail because we're trying so many different things, it's not always going to work. Um, and so the attitude was, it's okay to fail as long as we also learn something from it too, so it makes it better. So if you do have a, uh, uh, I don't even want to call it a, a failure story, but if you do have a, a story on, we did this and it was great, but you know we had, uh, it, it was, it was a, it was a long way to get here. We had some times when it didn't work exactly right. So you know that's an interesting story in itself. Um, I don't think, um, or I would hope that a lot of people don't expect that things are going to work perfectly the first time. Um, it usually doesn't work in real life. Uh, it shouldn't work in science. And frankly, that's one of science's strengths in my view is because you can make a mistake or make an error or a miscalculation. You go back and you look at what went wrong, what could we do differently, and you, the next step is usually much, much better. And that's how we build on great science. So I would be honest with about some, with, about some of those stories. Yep, we had some missteps, we had some failures, this didn't work, but this did, and this is how we got to where we are. And Olivia, just jumping in too, I think, um, I think that's Great, and I agree. I think it can actually provide more um, validation for the strength of science because you say, you know, yes, we have these mistakes, and you know what? That's not that's not what we base the rest of science on. That's how science works. Not only do we learn from our mistakes to improve our methods in the future, to ask different questions, or see that we are asking the, you know, looking at it from the wrong angle to begin with, but it shows you how strong. Um, the the argument has to be for something for people to accept it in science because so much testing and practice and you know discovery of error and return and fixing goes into finding out every piece of science. So I think you can actually, depending on how you frame it, use it to demonstrate why science is valid. Excellent, excellent point. Um, thank you both. So. There really aren't any other questions, which I just, oh, here we go. Here are <laughs> I know, I should have said something. Um, <laughs> all right, give me one second. <laughs> OK, so the question is about getting scientists to adjust their expectations for non-scientists when they share their science. Um, this questioner says, I trained a bunch of scientists for a public engagement event 
And when reading over their feedback, um, one reported that we give the non-scientists suggested questions um, because they felt they were asking bad questions. So the question is, how do you adjust the view of non-scientists for scientists? Um, I'm not, I, so from my perspective, Olivia's perspective, I would want to know what those questions were, frankly, first. Um, because I think there are two ways to look at this. Sometimes, yes, there are people who might be hostile or unreceptive audiences or people who may not understand who are asking questions that are just either antagonistic or really out there in some way. And those are opportunities, I think, for those who've, who've done a little work in communication to use bridging questions, you know, bridging responses to say, you know what, I don't, you know, I can't really address that issue. This isn't really, you know, as connected to the points that I'm being, that I'm trying to make, but what I can tell you about this is, or what I think, you know, the real takeaway here is, or what I feel we have an opportunity for with what I'm telling you is, and then you can move back into your own messages, which also speaks to what Jana was saying about developing those messages to begin with, so that you know that you have ways to return to those when you're responding to questions. So that those kinds of questions, you know, I think that's a way for those scientists who are responding to get back to what they're hoping to say. Um, if it's just questions they don't like, though, but they're still related to the science, you know, then I, I think it's worth asking a little more about what a bad question means. But uh, well, and and I, I agree with Olivia totally. But to something else too is um, know your audience. You know, figure out who who the scientists are going to be talking to, and prepare the scientists because I've worked with some scientists uh, who had similar responses and they're almost um, uh, taken aback that uh, people don't understand what they're talking about after they've explained it. And I said to them, I said, you know, you've gone to school, you've been studying this for 20 years, you're trying to explain something, uh, explain this to someone who's hearing it for the first time. You can't expect them to grasp everything unless you um, talk directly to them. So I think there's a, a, a set of expectations perhaps that the speakers may have that need to be tamped down and maybe there's a different level of, um, of, uh, of kind of advanced work as we would call it is figuring out who they're going to be talking to, what might be some of their issues, what do these people care about in this particular area, um, and also to, to prepare scientists for those kinds of questions. Um, we, we did that a lot with, in media relations. Um, you're going to be asked about your science, but then somebody's going to ask you about this. How are you going to respond? And Olivia's idea of having some bridging uh, responses to, to bring it back to what you can and want to talk about are very, very valuable. Hey, thank you both. Um, so there's a, there's a quick question about, um, that I can answer really quickly, about uh, how do you get congressional people to come to your event? Uh, our public affairs program is, uh, there are government relations folks, and they talk about this a lot in webinars and resources and different types of things. So um, probably the best way to do it is when we send out a follow-up email after the webinar, we can just add a bunch of uh, information to it on um, things more relevant to um, congressional affairs type audiences. But can I make a, a of comment? Of course. Um, this, this is Jana. One way to um, uh, increase the chances is to find out uh, a is, is this taking place in the uh, especially the, con the uh, Congress person because they have a very small district does this have any of their constituents is this an issue that their constituents are concerned about does it take place in some place within that person's district because that would it make a good photo op well, uh, would it make a good photo op that's great because um, that's what they care about Senators are a little bit different because they're covering the entire state. So you've got a little bigger latitude, but then it's also a little bigger lift. So um, if you've got a uh, perhaps a, a lab or an event in uh, state A but district B, you know, you might not be able to get um, the congressperson from district C because it has nothing to do with his or her constituents. Um, uh, I'm sure that uh, the information that you'll get from AGU will say the same thing, but they are very constituent-oriented. 
um, they are there to represent those people. So um, doing some homework, finding out what um, the congressperson is interested in could increase your chances. And food helps. <laughs> and just to mention uh, two things quickly. There will be more webinars this year, including one uh, that our policy folks will be doing on the best ways to post, uh, make district visits. So yeah. August is the congressional recess. If you don't want to have to travel to D.C. to talk with your uh, representatives or senators, this is a great time to do it in your home state. And there'll be a webinar all about both the logistics of that and some good tips for messaging for them. Great. All right. How do you handle speaking to a mixed audience where you have senior scientists um, who potentially wouldn't be convinced without jargon and technical language, but still communicate simply to lay people? Um, this is Jana. I would say uh, communicate simply to lay people because even people who have a lot of knowledge, they, they appreciate it when things are presented clearly and concisely. Um, and that is probably going to be the harder thing to do than just presenting it in a way that the, uh, that the senior scientists could understand. Let me give you an example. Um, I, when I was at NOAA, we did a conference call on an international uh, report that was that, that had come out, and um, we had it was a, phone, a telephone call, and we had a lot of uh, uh, reporters from uh, around the, around the world actually on, on on the call, and our scientists, and we had about four or five scientists on the phone, and there was one scientist who was explaining something and, and trying to answer a question and using a lot of scientific language, using a lot of jargon. Uh, he explained it very well. Uh, but it was very technical. And then the next question from the reporter was, um, I'd like to ask a follow-up question. And we said, yes, of course. And she said, well, could uh, scientist X please explain what scientist Y just said? So even though this individual did explain it you know, beautifully, accurately, um, he was interesting, it wasn't understandable. So, you know, Try uh, to use some of the tips that Olivia shared with you early on. Um, it does take a lot of work to get things in understandable language, but it certainly pays off and you can use it again and again and again. And we actually see this a lot um, at AGU's fall meeting. You know, there are so many different disciplines represented. An argument has been made by some of the scientists that you want to try to reduce your jargon even there because you may have people from other fields with whom you might want to collaborate someday or just you know, communicate with who would be in the audience who will have no idea what you're talking about if you use the language that is specific to your subfield. And going along with that, there's um, a suggestion for giving talks. Um, use a bunch of images, basically yeah. um, the, this uh, um, commenter says they found it uh, very powerful and a very yeah, useful tool. Yeah, 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 that is so true. All right, so um, we often run up against political issues since science becoming so politicized. Uh, what are suggestions for bridging ideological and or political gaps or perhaps steering away from political aspects altogether? Ooh, great question. It is a great question. Um, I can, uh, this, is, this is Jana, and because I was at NOAA during a political time during the Bush administration, we um, had that, ran, in, ran into that a lot. Um, at that time, my, my basic uh, advice to my scientists was um, stick to the science. Talk about what you know. You are there as a scientist. You are representing your science. Um, if there were political or uh, uh, contentious issues, um, we would just have them refer them to the public affairs office or some, or you know, or somebody in the legislative affairs office to to answer. Um, the scientist isn't there to uh, talk about politics. It isn't he or she's not there to um, uh, really talk about controversial issues. However. Um, in the recent uh, the recent climate that we're in, and that's you know pun intended, um, I, I'm seeing more and more scientists seeing the value of talking about their science in a political way. 
Um, it's those who are doing it are very good at it. Um, if you're not comfortable doing it, um, if you've got any qualms, I would suggest don't doing it because it can be very, very tricky. Um, I would definitely work with a communications person. I would definitely, if you're, in, if you're with an institution or a university or a, a federal agency, do not go off and do this on your own. <laughs> um, but if you're, um, uh, I, I, I guess my point would be to basically, you know, stay with your science, stay with what you know, and that'll be a lot easier for you. I mean, I just said, I think, you know, Jenna is totally right and uh, about, you know, the, the care you want to take and what you want to think about. And certainly if you belong to, uh, if you're working uh, within the government or any situation where you feel that you could misrepresent your institution yeah. or get in trouble with your institution, you really, you know, want to either hesitate or in any case check with your public information office and your government affairs office. No question. That said, you know, there are a lot of people who want to talk about, say, climate science research, if that's what they're doing. And if you want to do that to more public audiences, more power to you. You know, you do just want to think about it first. And it is true that when you talk about any topic to an audience that you anticipate is going to be potentially unreceptive or that there's a lot, of, there's a really charged atmosphere around it, that's when you want to work extra hard on these other elements of connecting with your audience to begin with. You know, you want to talk about your origin story. You want to humanize yourself and personalize yourself and your science so that they feel they have a connection with you and you can open up some dialogue before you talk about whatever specifics of the science you're getting into. Because then people are going to be more open to listening to you. You might not convince anyone who's totally, you know, adamant, but you're going to make it a very different atmosphere. And you can choose too how you want to frame a topic. Again, I'm thinking about climate change science because it's such a politicized issue these days. Obviously, there are others as well. But, you know, depending on your audience, maybe you just talk about sea level rise and its effects on flooding in this area or how it's, you know, um, affecting neighborhoods. Maybe you talk about drought and the crop failure and how you're seeing intensified drought and you don't necessarily use the word climate change depending on your audience. If you feel you're still getting across the message that matters to you and that matters to your audience, then that's another way to approach it that may make it more uh, open and allow you to actually have some dialogue. Yeah, and, and Olivia is right, and that's why I had that slide of the wildfires in um, uh, in Canada. Um, you don't necessarily have to say, well, the, you know, talk about climate. Just say. It, it's drier. What were the what are the reasons why we had all of these wildfires? And you can actually, if you do it skillfully enough, and this takes time and it takes work. If you do it skillfully enough, you can kind of lead your person to their own conclusion without even having to say that. So for the wildfires, you know, why are we having so many wildfires? Well, it's drier. It's hotter. Why is it drier and hotter? So you know, you 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 put out the dots and let them connect those dots. But it's not easy to do. It's not something for somebody who's never done it before. And there are a lot of communications people who can, and science communications people who can help you if this is what uh, you really want to do. And I guess that plays into uh, this question. It's, well, what if you, um, what do you do if you're not really comfortable sharing more of these personal stories? Um, kind of to your point, Olivia, about humanizing it first and then going from there. Um, I, I think it depends on, on what you feel is, is personal, right? I mean, sure, if you don't want to talk about what as a child first sparks your interest in science because it's very private, you know, that's I respect that. Um, but, you know, there are surely elements that you can tell. If you're a field scientist, you can tell a little bit about starting by saying, well, what do I do most days during my field season? I go out, you know, I eat my breakfast of whatever is in the field, you know, make sure I've got my hip waders with me, you know, I'm counting the number of mosquito bites I've gotten by half an hour out of my tent. You can add those kinds of elements that still give it a personal touch without necessarily talking about things outside of the science that you don't feel comfortable sharing. Or even, even just the passion that you have for the science. So if you say things like, we had tried so hard, we were so frustrated, and when this worked out, I was thrilled. I was over the moon. 
that too makes it, um, you know, makes people realize how this is this is a labor of love. So you're still bringing in that personal element without necessarily sharing things you feel uncomfortable about. Thanks. So we have a, um, a suggestion for another um, kind of work with multiple meaning or a, or a, a sciency word. Um, appreciate that multiple meanings is included in your definition of jargon. Do you have theory on your list? Ah, uh, I've mm -hmm. run into the mis uh, understanding of this term many times. The general public theory leaves much more room for suspicion than we might mean the scientific community. Theory of evolution, the Big Bang theory, etc. Theory to us means concepts that we are most sure of. Right, right. And so why can't we say that? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really good point. And uh, I think theory is much more seen as hypothesis in the general public. Well, and, and on a related term, I know some people um, are skeptical of science because a lot of times scientists will talk about the uncertainty. You know, so you've got this great finding, but there is like a... a you know, there's the error bars, and we've maybe like 10, 10% uncertainty. Um, when I was at NOAA, we had, I worked, had the great pleasure of working with a great scientist, um, Dan Albritton, and he used to use the old um, view graphs, you know, those uh, see-through things that you put on the slide, transparencies yeah. that you put on the slide projector. Thanks, Olivia. And he would make these beautiful drawings. And instead of talking about uncertainty, he would talk about confidence. And he would have a little scale on the right-hand side of each finding. So it's like 90, we're 90% 90 confident about this finding or this result or uh, or, or, or what we've done. Um, and I think that's a, a different way of, of framing it and putting it in a way that people are uh, themselves would find more confident. You know, when you go to the doctor and the doctor says you've got a 95% chance of, you know, God forbid, having a heart attack if you uh, don't do this, um, you know, that's going to get your attention rather than saying, well, you've got a 5% chance of not having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it, it's how you, um, again, it's knowing the people to whom you're speaking and reframing things that are still accurate but more understandable and more compelling to your audience. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. We got... Um one more, so if folks have more questions, please put them in. Uh, this one, this one, one we're not going to answer right this very second, but um, it's probably, well, you'll see. I guess I'm being overly dramatic. Uh, how has it happened that communication from scientists is being seen as opaque? How has speaking in a very complex, jargony way become the norm? Oh. That was oh. my point. <laughs> more of something to think about. So, so the question is more, how has the specialized language become mm -hmm. the norm? Well, I mean, I think we've seen this, John, I'll certainly let you answer this too, but just yeah. to start with Olivia, I think, you know, we've seen a, a an ex more and more extreme level of special, specialization over time, certainly in, um, you know, uh, the West, since let's say 1800 or so, even before, but let's say around then, you know, the, the 19th century, you have a lot of people who are naturalists, let's say, mm -hmm. who are autodidacts, who, right. you know, um, are not specially trained and don't necessarily have that as a career, often because they're lucky enough to be rich white males who actually <laughs> are often noticed. So there's a whole problem there, too. But, you know, they have this wider range of interests, so there's not the sense that you have to be a professional. And also, these are often people who are enthused about a variety of subjects, including, you know, literature, the arts, and so on. So they're doing their own drawings. They're describing things in a lyrical and accessible manner. They're writing for an audience that is composed of other enthusiasts like them, but also of a, of a wider public, I think, generally. And as you get more into the realm of people doing this for their careers and the specialization of fields becoming narrower and narrower and narrower, so that now in biology departments we can't even necessarily talk to one another, you know, I would argue that's part of what's led uh, to that space. Well, and let me add on that, and that was beautiful because I, I love the Victorian naturalist. That's a, 
particular uh, uh, area of interest for me. But um, Olivia was exactly right. But also jargon itself is kind of a, a communications shorthand. So it's a kind of a language within a language. So it's a language among your peers. So instead of explaining something that, that's maybe you know three or four words long, you've got a word for it that you understand so you can communicate with that particular person or group of people quickly because they'll understand. The, the trick and the very hard part is, and that's why what you know AGU has done with the different words as well as uh, Susan Joy Hassel and Richard Somerville with different words is, okay, you know what these words mean, a, a small group of people might know what they mean, but does a larger audience know what they mean? And that really is the hard part. So um, I know some uh, scientific journals now ask for a plain language abstract. Including um, all of the AGU journals? Including, all, yay, AGU. Um, but it's also a good exercise if you're writing a paper, um, uh, not, it, you know, not for one of these journals, but I, I hope you, you uh, submit to AGU a lot. Um, but it's a good exercise to, to take one of your papers, and if you're a scientist, and how, you know, do a plain language abstract. Um, and as Olivia said earlier, sometimes you'll have to use more words to explain it, but there'll be words that your audience will understand. So it's not just substituting one word for another. It's really thinking about what you're trying to say, the people to whom you're trying to say it, and what words are going to be receptive to them to get your message across. Great. Thank you both. Um, we got another one. Our scientists are asked to describe the societal value of their work, and they struggle with this. Do you all have any advice for this? Can you give me an example, for instance? We, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to my NOAA thing, and we, and we also had to uh, provide uh, maybe a description, because people want to know, well, what's, what's it worth? So, you know, what, what's a good weather forecast worth? Um, well, you're going to save lives. You're going to, you know, people are going to be able to plan their days better if they know it's going to rain or if it's not going to rain. What's a, a good hurricane forecast? I mean, that was, uh, Noah spent a lot of time on a hurricane forecast because you've got to move people out of the way, and more and more people are in the way now of coastal storms, more severe storms. Um, uh, I'm sure this number has gone up, but I think at one time it would cost a million dollars a mile to evacuate people in Hawaii. Um, that's why when NOAA developed the tsunami warning buoys, um, and the buoys were able to uh, alert Hawaii that uh, there, there was a, a, a possible tsunami, they realized it was a false alarm. Hawaii did not have to evacuate, and I think they saved about $8 million, and of course all the terror and uh, stress of people trying to pack up and, and, and get to safety. Um, there's a huge societal value to science. You just have to figure out what it is to a particular group or audience. And sometimes you can't put numbers on things. Um, I know when I was at NOAA, we uh, at one point were told, well, you, this particular group has to discover like X number of new species uh, a year. You know, how do you do that? I mean, one day you you can discover like 6,000 new species and not discover anything else for the rest of the year. Um, it's hard to put numbers on things, but I think if you show the value to the taxpayer, which is really what it comes down to, saving lives, protecting property, um, uh, making people's lives better, um, I'm sure everything falls into at least one of those three pockets, and I'm sure there's even more that I'm not aware of. Yeah, and I mean, so just to go back to my research again, which was really basic research, I mean, again, I, I, my shorthand for it is I studied the sex lives of marine snails. Not a lot of applied value right there, you know. Um, but, you know, in broader terms, you can talk about how reproduction is a really critical part of any species' survival. Right, and knowing how big populations are going to be yep. in the future. And, you know, sometimes things come up based on this. If we know about this for populations, it helps us know how to interact with them. Like these snails I studied, you know, they didn't mean anything much on the East Coast. There were cute shells to pick up on the beach, but they've become invasive off the coast of France and Britain, and they're actually covering oyster beds. Well, suddenly it really matters to know things about their reproduction, right? Because you want to save the livelihoods of all of these people harvesting oysters. 
So when you can give examples like that to show how this knowledge, even if it's not got direct application, you know, fits into this broader area, as John was saying, if you know, economy, safety, security, health, then you're a long way, way there. Great. Thank you both. Um, and that's about all we got. Okay. Great. Perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Well, thank all you, so everybody. Much. Yes, this is great. This has been great and very lively. And uh, again, stay tuned because we're going to have plenty more webinars this year.